Hello everyone, welcome to Sunrise Extra on a Tuesday. We have been having some excellent special guests join us uh, live for our shows and today is no exception. We have uh, Cameron Witten. He is a well-known community activist here in Portland for the last couple of years and founder of Brown Hope and the Black Resilience Fund. You may have probably seen him on your um, Tri-County Area Voters ballot. You just ran for a seat on the Metro County Good morning, Cameron. Thank you so much for getting up early with us and um, talking about these such important issues. How are you doing today after seeing such powerful images last night? We saw the die in um, the lay down protest on the Burnside Bridge in Pioneer Square. I love seeing, um, you know, we had reports of, you know, someone was trying to take down the American flag at Pioneer Square. The crowd stopped that person and just a really powerful night on this fourth night in Portland. How are you doing? Thank you so much. And, you know, we are all witnessing uh, a painful, a long and painful week. That's been an extension of uh, a year that's challenged all of us. And so uh, for too long now, uh, I have woken up to these headlines. I have woken up to these tragedies. And, you know, two days ago, we decided to do something different, and we saw the number of members of our black communities hurting uh, in pain with trauma, and we wanted to create a space for us to have hope, healing, and resilience. And so I'm waking up today feeling resilient uh, because uh, we have faced these injustices before, and I know that there is a better future worth fighting for. And so I am determined to do what I can with my voice, with my connection, for us to take action and to continue to fight for a better future. And so I wake up this morning with that determination, that resilience. Uh, we had a peaceful protest yesterday. Uh, I'm so glad I've been a part of many protests and I want our protesters to feel safe. I want our community members who live in downtown and other areas where there are protests, protests to feel safe. But I also know that there are bad news to come. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in my radio show, I wrote, a, a, a paper, uh, I wrote an article for a local paper, and uh, we used the picture of uh, Devontae Hart, 12-year-old black kid who was hugging a police officer here in mm -hmm. Portland mm -hmm. that was shared a million times over uh, across the world as a symbol of hope. And two years ago, uh, Devontae Hart and his five black and brown siblings were killed in a murder-suicide. Mm -hmm. And so I know that these protests are just one part of what we need to do to raise awareness and to demand change. We have to take action. And so I'm determined not just for us to speak up, but for us to actually take the steps that we need to do to close the gap of injustice. Can we talk about the generation gap just a little bit? Because I know here at mm -hmm. KGW, we're really trying to get some different voices on the yeah. air yeah. and to understand everyone's experience. So yeah. we've talked to a lot of faith leaders, um, some who mm -hmm. were um, there during the civil rights movement of yeah. the 60s. You're in your late 20s. You're a completely yeah. different generation. Can you mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about your story? Can you tell me specifically some of the things that are most concerning for your generation thank you so for our generation the the challenge is is that we are following the footsteps of people who became came before us who helped to pass groundbreaking legislation to support black and brown lives the challenge of our generation is that these new laws have been, not been enough we have continued to see housing discrimination, over-policing. Uh, we've seen death by systems of policing, criminal justice, by poverty, and so many more. And uh, what we're hearing from our neighbors is, but the civil rights movement, we hear that all the time. The civil rights movement was successful. We, were, we made some positive steps forward, but for many of our non-black siblings, who do not realize that 
we did not go far enough. And so for people in my generation, we're having to go the extra mile to educate folks so they, they understand that uh, the reality of our communities is dire. We are fearing for our lives every single day. And we have to continue to fight for groundbreaking systemic changes. The work isn't done. We got a lot accomplished with the civil rights movement. We have continued to see 40 plus years of mass criminalization, of the exacerbation of poverty. These things that are not getting the attention that they deserve. We're seeing failed leadership from our elected officials. We're seeing it from our neighbors. We have to push farther. And that's why we're seeing these riots. Things have gotten so out of control that we are seeing disempowered people, people who are frustrated and who have tried to sit patiently, who have used the slogans, who have put signs in their yard, um, who are not seeing the results that they need. And so uh, this is a cry of desperation that we truly need to look in the mirror and to acknowledge that there is so much we need to do. We have to make real sacrifices with the privileges that we have to ensure that our disempowered voices actually have a real opportunity in America. You know, this, uh, this latest chapter, Cameron, and thank you again for joining us here on Sunrise Extra. Uh, this latest chapter that we've been watching uh, goes back to last Monday, so eight days ago mm -hmm. now, when we saw what I would describe as, a, as a, an awful cop, a terrible cop and a terrible human being. When I mm -hmm. think of uh, that police officer, to me, he is the definition of a bully, and I have hated bullies mm -hmm. since I was in school, right? Someone who mm -hmm. takes their power and abuses that. Um, mm -hmm. So, but I feel like when you're talking about the injustices and things need to change, you're talking about more than just the way the police in our country treats African Americans. Am I right in saying that? You are 100% correct. We cannot scapegoat just one system. We have to look holistically. We have to look with intersectionality. We have to see the interrelation of all of these things. It is not just that there was a bad cop. We have the stigma. If you are a, a black man on the street, you are a threat for some, you are already assumed guilty of something. We just haven't figured out what it is yet. That is the system that killed George Floyd. You know, we had a cop who had poor judgment, who has a level of bias against black people, but it was the societal bias that gave that police officer the impression that he had the impunity to do what he did. Racist cops should be afraid to be racist cops. This person was on film and still felt like he had the protection to do right. what he did because we have seen so many police officers do that very same thing and get away without punishment. And so it is bigger than just one individual. It is the fact that we have a cultural injustice, mm. and systemic injustices that have completely broken our system. We need a reset. We need a reset and to acknowledge that all of this is wrong. So Cameron, all that start, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you. I just want to bring in people who are watching because I think yeah. this is an amazing question. It's a perfect yeah. thing for you to answer. Lindsay Justice, good morning to you out there, says, my daughter wants to protest, but at 14, I'm not comfortable with that. You can understand mm -hmm. why. What can we actively do as a family? Isn't that a mm -hmm. great question? question. It's a good question, and I would encourage folks to uh, find ways to show up. Uh, I started protesting at an extremely young age, and uh, there are many different protests. There are vigils. Coordinate a vigil. You know, uh, there are opportunities to, you know, do sign waving in your neighborhood to uh, call and check in on your neighbors. So there are opportunities to show up for justice that are not just uh, staying up until 11 o'clock at night at a protest. Um, that's why we launched the Black Resilience Fund. We're in a unique time where so many people want to be able to show up, go to a protest, and they can't. And we know that 
we need to do more than just protest. We have to show to our black siblings here in our community that we want the best for them. And so we launched the Black Resilience Fund to actually help black Portlanders heal and be more resilient by giving them direct cash support for bills, for emergency expenses, for a warm meal, for groceries, whatever they need. And so uh, there are lots of opportunities. That is, you know, talking to your family members, donating to a black-led organization, going to a vigil, going to a protest, never giving up. Uh, we're going to be doing this work for a long time. So I especially urge people, because this is one of my biggest frustrations as a longtime organizer, is that uh, somebody's killed. We have, uh, you know, Ahmad Arbery, we have a Sandra Bland, a Tamir Rice. We show up for that weekend to do, go protest, and then where do the people go? You know, after George Floyd was killed, I had about two dozen white friends who texted me, who called me, asked me how I'm doing, and my initial response was, where have you been? Hmm. All of a sudden, like, I've been in Portland for 10 years, and all of a sudden you're checking on me because this one black man died? Every single day, I have to overcome obstacles in my life. You check in me on me because you read a headline. Our black communities are suffering even when there aren't headlines. And so this is work that takes daily action. And so that's more than just protesting. We got to protest when the time calls for it. But every single day, we are asking for our community members to look at themselves and ask what have they done that day to advance racial justice. It's a marathon. I would say when I hear that, though, Cameron, I do think to myself, geez, it was nice of them to reach out. I mean, you know, not to put it lightly, but if you it say, is a touchy thing. I was just have, thinking the same thing. If you have that thing. reaction, don't you say to someone, well, you know what, then shoot, next time I may not reach out because I don't know what's going to upset you and what's not. I, I do get a sense of that a little bit when I hear that reaction. And you can. It's about learning. No, you're right. It's about learning. It's about learning how to be a consistent ally. We can't just wait until we feel guilty enough. We just can't wait until there's a headline. We are dealing with communities that are dealing with trauma. And unless you have a real authentic relationship, if you are doing it just because it's a convenient time for you, then yes, there are going to be consequences to that. And so what I'm saying to folks is have real authentic relationships and show up on a daily basis. The, the challenge is that if we only show up when we read a headline, uh, we've done, we were too late. We need to be preventative. You know, I did have friends who checked in on me, who have checked in on me every single week. I didn't have any issues with people who have actually been in my life constantly cheering me on, working with me. But these other folks who just came out of nowhere, who've never checked on me in a single day of my life, I have to ask myself, what prompted you to do that? Do you actually care about me or do you just currently feel guilty enough to do something? And so I'm calling on folks to transform that temporary emotional response into long-term action because it's that long-term action that we're going to need to really get to the finish line. Mm -hmm. So you ran for the Metro Council seat. Mm -hmm. What do you see? What changes did you really want to see in Portland, maybe with Portland police? Um, we yesterday mm -hmm. we had on um, Reverend Edie Mondane and mm -hmm. talked about community policing boards and a review board. Mm -hmm. And we've mm -hmm. heard, you know, police departments across the country have mm -hmm. maybe their internal review board who they are very charitable with mm -hmm. when handing out, you know, possible um, repercussions in police mm -hmm. brutality cases or complaints. And, mm -hmm. um, and precedent sets a lot of tone for police officers. If you're mm -hmm. trying to make a change in a department, well, this officer did this 10 years ago and they weren't punished, so this new guy shouldn't be punished mm -hmm. either. And it just seems impossible to kind of move forward. What do you want to see in Portland and what did you really kind of run on? So uh, I ran for Metro Council, which is our regional government that looks a lot at planning and zoning for our region. And so one of my biggest motivations was to address the displacement of black communities in North and Northeast Portland. Uh, and uh, I think that and, and the reality is that because of intersectionality, these things are tied. We're talking about a community that had social cohesion, that had churches and schools and businesses uh, specifically serving the black community that helped them access the opportunities they needed to thrive. They have lost that. 
And with displacement, they're out in communities with neighbors who will call the police on them and possibly get them killed. And so these things are truly intersected. They're truly connected. Um, and so specifically, uh, continuing to call uh, for us to support policies that are allowing our communities to return to North and Northeast Portland, to have neighbors who understand their experiences, uh, to have community policing. Uh, because the reality is that some of our communities do not understand that they put the lives of black people in jeopardy, you know, if they call the police, if they look at their neighbors and assume that they are guilty of some crime. And so uh, we need to, you know, create new systems of accountability. Uh, what I focus on is advocating to change our the criminalization of poverty. We have to end the war on crimes of survival. Our systems are not working. And so we need to go down to Salem and start passing legislation that is looking at how do we overturn some of these uh, short-sighted uh, policing uh, legislation. And so uh, I commend the work of the NAACP. Uh, the uh, Black Resilience Fund is raising money. We've raised over $1,000. Uh, for the NAACP, we have to work together to look systemically at the injustices in our system and get to work. Yeah, Cameron, and I have to say, um, sometimes it feels so overwhelming. You kind of mentioned mm -hmm. the intractable nature of mm -hmm. race in America, um, mm -hmm. starting way before the 1960s in the civil rights mm -hmm. movement. So when it feels overwhelming to me, I go micro. I go mm -hmm. within my sphere and what I can control mm -hmm. and the people who come in contact with me. Again, yeah. my experience as a you know, 50-some-year-old woman mm -hmm. is way different than yours, and yours mm -hmm. is way different than somebody else's. There are yeah. some commonalities, but I'm just going to say this, and you can take it for what it's worth. It's more directed to me than anybody else. I mm -hmm. feel like what I'm going to do and what I try to do, what I will continue to try mm -hmm. and do, is to extend some grace where appropriate. Mm -hmm. Because I think mm -hmm. the biggest, um, not the biggest, but one of the biggest problems is just true ignorance. When people don't mm -hmm. know, they don't know what they don't know. They don't know what's mm -hmm. offensive. They don't know, um, mm -hmm. they don't know the people you know, that they haven't come in contact with. And if mm -hmm. I get the opportunity, if I get the opportunity to expand some minds by having mm -hmm. those conversations, yeah. that's what I'm going to try and do in my position of privilege, being mm -hmm. a woman on TV and one who's had a long career here. I think those are the types of things when you talk about being together and making connections that we have to do. We absolutely yeah. have to do because the moment People feel defensive, they never come back over. It's like, I'm done, I'm not gonna go there. So I get that point, I get all the points. That's why it's messy and it's complicated and mm -hmm. it is um, difficult. It's not gonna be pretty, it's painful. And it's painful mm -hmm. um, particularly to the people who are enduring it, but there's a different kind of pain and discomfort coming from the other side and somehow mm -hmm. we've got to find some common ground so we can mm -hmm. become allies and we can get a few more people in the tent. Does that make sense? It makes 100% sense. And as somebody who has spent the last five years as a nonprofit executive director serving vulnerable communities, what we need to be talking about, and I'm calling on you as our you know, media, our elected officials, our neighbors, we need to be talking about trauma. Uh, that is one thing that we it, it, it subtly mentioned. You know, we witnessed the murder of George Floyd, and many people have said, that was me, that was my brother, that was my sibling. We have heard that over and over again. And what we're hearing is trauma. You know, trauma is an injury to your mind and to your soul. Mm -hmm. And what could be physical pain to one person can be twice as much pain to somebody with emotional and mental pain. And that is what we have to acknowledge, is that trauma impacts the way that we interact with the world. And so uh, we have white communities that are traumatized, black communities are traumatized. And when you experience trauma, and you see that trauma collide, it can have perilous outcomes. And so, yeah, we need to st stretch out. We need to stretch out and reach out to our communities. And we have to realize that we have to do that in a way that is informed about how trauma works. 
that we are not making the problem work. Mm. And that's hard work to do. But we all can learn more about how we can do this work in a trauma-informed way that we are all actually helping each other heal. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard, but we know that we can do better. And real quickly, you are the founder of the Black Resilience Fund, and I just have yes. a little note that in two days you guys raised over forty thousand dollars. Well, you guys as of can... this morning, we're actually at sixty-two thousand. Wow, that's amazing! Yes. What do you guys use the money toward? Kind of tell people um, so maybe they can support your fund. Yeah, we're asking folks please go to GoFundMe. It's called the Black Resilience Fund. We have raised over sixty-two thousand dollars with eight hundred people who have donated. We are encouraging healing and resilience for our local black court leaders, taking action locally. We have already distributed over $20,000 to help pay for a warm meal, groceries, emergency expenses, medical, student loan debt, whatever is a pain for a, a black court lender, whatever that is taking their focus, we are trying to say, we've got you covered. So you can focus on continuing to improve the life of you and your family. And so we are inspired by these hundreds of Portlanders who have taken action to help us. Our goal is to raise $100,000. And so I'm going to be working on that until we get to $100,000. We have moved people to tears. We are transforming lives. This is an opportunity not just for us to get in the streets and protest, but for us to show that we actually want black Portlanders here in our neighborhood to thrive. So please donate. Help us make a difference. At $62,000, well I would say you are on your way, my yeah. friend. Mm -hmm. So thank you for joining thank us you. today. Uh, we've done well over 20 minutes here, Cameron. I know time <laughs> flies when you're having fun on Sunrise Extra, but thank you for coming on with us today. Uh, our next edition of this show, of course, is tomorrow. We'll see you Wednesday. Thanks, Cameron. Stay healthy. Bye.